We completely missed it. The lost sheep really isn't lost the way modern Christianity would see it. When he says lost sheep, he's referring to believers. Please don't take this idea I'm about to present as definite. I could be wrong. I just want to try to get you thinking about things that maybe you hadn't before. So ahead of this topic, I need to lay some groundwork. First thing I want to explain is the faith spectrum, which gives me the basis for this claim. It explains faith in terms of growth and not so much as black or white. Imagine, if you will, a bar with green on one side and red on the other and merging in the middle. The greenest point will represent bold faith or strong belief, and the reddest point will represent wicked or militant unbelief. The middle will represent baby faith or mild unbelief, such as agnostic. I'd like to call this range Seeker. An example would be Pontius Pilate, where he asked Jesus, what is truth? Or Peter, who said, you are the Christ, yet denies him later. Then on the far red side, we have men like the Pharisees. And on the far green, men like the new and improved Peter, emboldened by the Holy Spirit. I need you to see this spectrum clearly before we can define who the lost sheep are. In order to make this stick in your mind even more, Jesus would use phrases like, O oh, you of little faith, and I have not found such great faith, which shows us the range of belief, but for unbelief, Jesus would say things like this, It shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you, and these will receive greater condemnation. The level of wickedness varies as well. So now we need to figure out which category of men are referred to as straying lost sheep. So let's define straying by looking at Hebrews chapters 2, 4, and 5. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. This links going astray with ignorance and weakness, which matches the condition of the Old Testament saints because they have not yet received the Holy Spirit, nor do the majority of them realize the identity of the Christ. It's still a mystery to them. Spiritually, the ignorant weak faith would more than likely be our lost sheep, based on scripture I'm about to share with you. I know this sounds far-fetched, but just hang with me. So we can say that the ones in the middle range have gone astray, but also the ones in the red range. As it says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So all have gone astray because of weakness. In other words, we're all sinners. But what makes you a lost sheep and not a wolf? Well, here's the difference. The mid-range sees the father, but the red range does not. What I mean by this is the sheep honors the father and lowers himself. He sees things as they truly are, while the other does not and elevates himself to a godlike status, making him wicked. For example, the Pharisee and the publican both have gone astray, but one admits it, the other doesn't. That is seeing the father. One has humbled himself in truth, the other hasn't. It's a small faith that has yet to be empowered. A great example of this is found in the book of Job. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Also, the psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Since I now see you, I understand my lack and God's fullness. With faith, God and man are viewed properly in truth. God is honored and man is dishonored. That's why only sinners were flocking to Jesus. They could see the Father, the small amount of truth they had, they believed. And that's why Jesus said this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you were of the Father, you would have been drawn to the Son because of the understanding that you needed restoration. However, there was confusion about how this restoration was to take place. This is what would have rendered them powerless and lost. A feeling of, what do we do now, and Lord help us. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? 
How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So whenever Jesus gives this parable, I think the focus is more so on the transition of covenants, not necessarily the conversion of unbelievers to believers, which is the mainstream thought. So when Jesus says lost sheep, I think he's referring to infant believers, men in that mid-range that have been confused about God, not only because of the lack of enlightenment, but because of the surrounding godless influences. These lost sheep are seeking to know God, but are led astray by lousy shepherds. That is the point of this parable. Let me show you what I mean. Right before Jesus gives the parable, we read this. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Then he starts the parable by restating this idea. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. This is key to understand what's going on here. In the Old Testament, life is not yet a reality. Old Testament believers who worship the Father are holding on to the promise of salvation, not the actualized salvation, as it says in Psalm 119. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Deliver me according to your word. Let your hand become my help for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. So it sounds to me like this lost sheep belonged to the Father because he was aware that he needed a restoration of life, that he needed aid from God to give him that inner light to lead him. Because at the time, men had set themselves up to mislead the people, as it says in Ezekiel. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. A good example of this cruelty is shown in the Gospel of Mark, where we see the poor widow bring in two mites and puts it into the coffers of the temple. Then Jesus said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes and Pharisees, who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Then the very next verse says, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which is the equivalent about a dollar fifty in American money. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had, her whole livelihood. This is not a lesson on tithing. This is an example of a current religious system devouring a widow's house, oppressing the poor. The people who are running the show are using the temple to take advantage of her instead of binding up her wounds. So here's a poor widow in need, but she believes. She believes in the Father, yet she has been led to lay down everything she has before a godless system the system that Christ called a den of thieves. So everything's upside down. The temple is supposed to represent God, so she should actually be receiving assistance from the temple because we know God's true desire by reading Isaiah. So the temple is being mismanaged, and because of this, this poor widow has the wrong idea about God and his character thanks to the teachings of the Jewish leadership. God's intent is to give life, not siphon off the rest of it. 
So God isn't the issue, it's the distortion of him. The shepherds only dress the part and present the priestly image with none of the priestly spirit. What's even worse is that Jesus said their real master was the devil, but this corruption will soon be dealt with as Ezekiel went on to prophesy. Woe to the shepherds of Israel, for you do not feed the flock, but with cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. My flock became prey, and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day, he is among his scattered sheep. So will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. This prophecy refers to God personally coming down to seek his sheep in the flesh. This is talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, seeking the sheep who were being taught lies about God and being presented with horrible examples of godliness. Perfect example is the woman at the well. She says that she knows that the Messiah is coming, which is a statement of belief, a looking forward to the Father's promise, which means her angel sees his face, as Matthew 18.10 stated. She has the Father, but we also see in the same passage a great deal of confusion in this woman as she asks, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So men who are supposed to be ambassadors of God are giving off the impression that God doesn't want Samaritans, that God doesn't want her. Yet Jesus is specifically seeking her out. Isn't that interesting? She also says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. You can see the confusion, yet Jesus, God himself, who sought her out, replies, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. He knew her heart and sought her. He specifically made a pit stop in Samaria at that well. He knew that she walked out there at a specific time every day because he sees her, just like he saw Nathanael under the fig tree, a man in whom was no deceit, as Jesus said. God knew these people, even though they don't yet understand the mystery. Having the desire for what she did not yet know was Jesus himself, the living water. Another example of this ignorance is when Paul proclaims the gospel in Greece. Then Paul said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For I was passing through and considered the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one you worship without knowing him, I will proclaim to you. He goes on to say, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. I hope these illustrate the point. The lost sheep may not be what we typically think it is. I also hope you're picking up on God's patience and his fairness because he's basing all of his judgments on the individual's limited knowledge. So with all that, let's read the parable. Jesus said, If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. So I believe the term little ones is also indicating early stages of faith. Children of the Father who don't yet know how to walk. And that is what the Christ came to show them. Of course, he came to cleanse us by his blood and give us life by the resurrection, but he also came to reveal the true character of the Father, which in turn course corrects and refines the mind, putting the lost sheep 
back on track. Last thing I want you to consider is if this is true, how would this affect the way you see other passages such as this one? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. I and my Father are one. Meaning those who already see the Father will recognize the Son. The men and women of Jesus' time are going through the transition of an era, the Old Testament faith into the empowered New Testament faith. The giving of the Holy Spirit, where men no longer have to rely on other men for truth, but can now directly approach the throne of God through the Spirit of Christ. The anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. He is now your teacher. Don't look to man, look to heaven, where Christ is. That's where true salvation and sanctification comes from. So what do you think? Was this a strong case? Was he referring to unbelievers or not? Let me know in the comments. God bless.